Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Matt Dillahunty knows the issues and the problem that fulfilled prophecy brings before the, the atheist. It, it's a huge problem. Literally hundreds of prophecies uh, that he fulfilled, and it, it's only by divine intervention that this could have possibly happened. The, this issue of fulfilled prophecy is so, it's such a problem for atheists. How, how powerful the, the evidence of prophecy. All the prophecies of the Old Testament that are fulfilled in Christ, there are literally hundreds of them, and it has to be divine intervention for them to come true. It, it just has to be. The prophecies about Jesus Christ are not vague. They're extremely specific. It, it's a huge problem. Hundreds of prophecies. Problem for atheists. Divine intervention. I like turtles. Huge problem. It, it just has to be. First it was the banana. Now Bible prophecy is the nightmare of every living atheist. Oh no, here comes prophecy. Whatever will we do? Well, take heart, unbelievers. I predict that by the end of this video, the menace of Bible prophecy will be rendered as harmless as Ray Comfort himself. In my Losing God series, I mentioned reading a book called Biblical Exegesis in the Apostolic Period by Richard Longenecker. He detailed the various exegetical methods used by first century Jews to understand the Old Testament. There was the Peshat, or literal interpretation of the text. Another category was allegorical, and it was utilized by men like Philo of Alexandria. Using this style, the Old Testament was treated as a body of symbols given by God for man's spiritual and moral benefit, which must be understood other than in a literal and historical fashion. There was also Midrash, an exegesis that goes deeper than the literal sense. It was used to explain difficult or unclear scriptures. For example, the Lilith Midrash was used to reconcile the two different creation accounts found in the book of Genesis. Then there was a method sometimes connected to Midrash called Pesher, which means solution or interpretation. It was featured heavily in the writings of the Qumran Dead Sea Scrolls community. Essentially, they believed God would communicate a raz, or mystery, within a book of scripture, while the Pesher, or solution to that mystery, would eventually be discovered by an interpreter. As F.F. F. Bruce puts it, not until the mystery and the interpretation are brought together can the divine communication be understood. And unlike the exegesis of the rabbis, the Pesher interpretations given at Qumran were revelatory and or charismatic in nature. In the Dead Sea community, the divinely appointed interpreter was their founder, a man called the Teacher of Righteousness, and no one could discover these prophecies without relying on his inspired interpretive principles. Longenecker's book shows how Jesus and his disciples employed all four exegetical methods within the New Testament to varying degrees. But what I'd like to focus on in this discussion is how the messianic prophecies fulfilled in the Gospels are based primarily on the Raz Pesher method, and not, as some might suppose, a literal method. I believe there is solid evidence for this position. Like Qumran's teacher of righteousness, Jesus established a new paradigm for interpreting the Old Testament. Jesus once gave this parable. Every scribe who is instructed in matters pertaining to the kingdom of heaven is like a man who is a householder who brings out of his treasury things new and old. J.W. Dove explains that along with the old ways, Jesus finds himself master of new disparate material, not previously taught or heard of. In other words, his exegesis of scripture will lead to results different from those formerly obtained. This new material included many mysteries, like how God's wisdom had been hidden until the creation of the church, or how the inclusion of the Gentiles was kept secret since the world began, but was finally realized during the church age. These kinds of revelations were to be expected. W.D. Davies points out that there existed an expectation within Judaism that with the coming of the Messiah, the enigmatic and obscure in the Torah would be made plain. And in a way, Jesus confirmed this expectation, although on earth he made those mysteries plain to his disciples. To everyone else, he spoke in parables.
So, how does all of this relate to Pesher and Bible prophecy? Well, when we read the fulfillment passages in Matthew and John's Gospels, it becomes abundantly clear that the writers believed the identity of the Messiah and his ministry were included as two of the mysteries hidden within the Torah. Some Christians may agree with that statement on its face, but they may not realize the full extent of it. We'll use Matthew 2.15 as an example. After Jesus' birth, we're told an angel appeared to Joseph, who told him to flee to Egypt with his family and remain there until he gave the word. Once King Herod died, it would be safe to return. And then the writer of Matthew declared, This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now the passage referred to here is Hosea 11.1, 1, and at first glance this might look like one of Tim's extremely specific prophecies. I mean, the verse says God called his son out of Egypt, and God called Jesus out of Egypt. So that's a literal fulfillment, right? Wrong! See, when we get to verse 2, we quickly discover that this same son eventually fell away from God by sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. <gasps> that doesn't sound anything at all like the Jesus we know, and for good reason. The passage wasn't about Jesus of Nazareth. Hosea 11.1 1 is a personification of the nation of Israel. The nation was considered God's son, but over the course of time, many of the people turned away and went after other gods. The chapter does contain prophecy, but it concerns God's promise to use Assyria to punish his disobedient children. Assyria's chastising of Israel happened long before the first century, and yet the Gospel writer declares the passage was fulfilled by Jesus coming out of Egypt. On the surface, this doesn't seem to make any sense. But Matthew's author was claiming fulfillment not based on a woodenly literal sense, nor on the historical grammatical context of the passage, but based on a newly created Christocentric paradigm. In other words, the author expected events in Israel's history to be personified in the life of Jesus, and these mysteries could only be identified by an inspired interpretation, or pesher. As Longenecker explains, Jesus seems to have viewed these Old Testament events not just as analogies that could be used for purposes of illustration, but as typological occurrences that pointed forward to their fulfillment in his own person and ministry. So if the Hebrews and Jesus both came out of Egypt, that was a divine typology. If Zechariah and Judas Iscariot both threw 30 pieces of silver into the temple, even though the circumstances were different, that was still a divine typology. No rabbi in the past could have studied those passages and found Jesus buried within. It took the Raz and the Pesher coming together before that kind of messianic connection could be made. And according to Luke's Gospel, Jesus is the one who established this new paradigm. In Luke 24, two of Jesus' disciples were on the road to Emmaus, disappointed that their Messiah had failed to live up to expectations. At some point in their journey, we're told the resurrected Jesus appeared next to them. But they did not recognize him since he had cast a first-level disguise self-spell on his character. He did the typical Jesus thing by criticizing them for their lack of vision. Then he proceeded to interpret to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. After they arrived at the village, the two disciples finally rolled successful knowledge checks and saw through Jesus' illusion. However, he countered this by casting a fifth-level teleportation spell and disappeared. What's important to note about... What's important to note about this story is that Jesus had to show his disciples where he was located in the Old Testament. It was not self-evident. Jesus did the same thing in verse 45. He magically appeared in a room full of his disciples and opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He had to do this because what was written about him in Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms was not obvious. As Longenecker puts it, at times passages that were accepted in Judaism as applying directly to the Messiah are cited. More frequently, however, passages are quoted that in Judaism were considered to have only tangential messianic relevance, that is, without any direct application to the Messiah or the messianic age, or none at all. Biblical quotations of this latter sort appear prominently in the preachings of the earliest Christians, as portrayed in the Acts of the Apostles. Listen to this clip from Tim's video. It's a sermon given by the martyred missionary Jim Elliot. You know, before he was murdered by natives. It's fascinating to me how these men use the Old Testament. In a way I should never dream of using it. In a way that seems often, in many cases, to stretch the original. 
and since they used the Greek version of the Old Testament, even to change words, and sometimes it seems like they changed tenses of verb. Indeed, they did, and it was commonplace at that time. The author of Matthew deviated from the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts by changing the verb tense in Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. The Jesus writing on a donkey prophecy is actually a composite of two different writings, Isaiah 62, 11 and Zechariah 9, 9. Then we go from stretching the original to finding it, because no known translation of the Hebrew Bible contains a prophecy that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. Some Christian scholars think it may be a punning allusion to the branch mentioned in Isaiah 11.1. 1. Others think the author of Matthew made a typological connection between Samson the Nazarite and Jesus of Nazareth. But no matter which way you slice it, this elusive prophecy seems to be based on wordplay. Tim insists the prophecies of Jesus are extremely specific. Prophecies about Jesus Christ are not vague. They're extremely specific. And yet Eliot later admits he would never have found Christ in Psalm 116 if it wasn't for the Apostle Peter. And that's because on its surface, the Psalm, quote, doesn't seem to indicate resurrection at all, end quote. As Walter Riggins admits, there is no self-evident blueprint in the Hebrew Bible which can be said to unambiguously point to Jesus. Only after one has come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and more specifically, the kind of Messiah that he is, does it all begin to make sense and hang together. And just so we're clear, that wasn't written by an atheist. Dr. Riggins is a Christian and a theologian with a passion for missionary outreach in Israel. I'll tell you what, let's take on one of Tim's favorite prophecies, the crucifixion. He insists that the Bible prophesied the Messiah would be nailed to a tree over a thousand years before crucifixion was even invented. A thousand years before it was even invented, it was told that Jesus would be nailed to a tree. Well, what do the Gospels say? In Matthew 16, Jesus and his disciples reached Caesarea Philippi, the northernmost limit of their ministry. And after nearly 22 months together, Jesus finally asked his friends, Who do you say that I am? Peter said, You are the Christ. To which Jesus replied, You are correct, sir. Verse 21 says, From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things, be killed, and rise from the dead three days later. But Peter took Jesus aside and said, Look, we already know this. We've heard that Isaiah teaches you will be cut off out of the land of the living. And according to the rabbis, Psalm 22 describes how this will happen. Your hands and feet will be pierced. That's obviously referring to Roman crucifixion. Uh, no. Peter's actual response was to rebuke Jesus and claim none of those horrible things would ever happen to him. It's pretty clear from this example that Peter had no concept of a crucified Messiah. Then in John chapter 12, after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus gathered a crowd and told them he must be lifted up from the earth. And he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. The crowd responded, tell us something we don't know. We've heard from the law that the Christ will be lifted up. And that was written over a thousand years before crucifixion was even invented. <coughs> Wrong again. What they actually said was, we've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? So not only were they completely unaware of the Old Testament teaching a crucified Messiah, but the scriptures had already convinced them the Messiah would not die. If Isaiah 53 had been a clear messianic prophecy, then Peter and the crowd of Jews would have anticipated that Jesus came to Jerusalem in order to be executed by the Romans. Because in Tim's view, the person in Isaiah 53 was to be cut off out of the land of the living, buried with the wicked, and then raised from the dead so that his days may be prolonged. But despite hundreds of years worth of rabbinic teachings, those Jews had no idea their Messiah would be crucified because that interpretation did not exist until Jesus came along. Wait just a minute, son. Your small sample size doesn't prove anything. You're ignoring literally hundreds of prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. The odds of fulfilling even eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. It takes more faith not to believe in Christ. Checkmate, atheist. Ah, yes, the hundreds of prophecies canard. Here's an example of such a list. 
and unlike most Christians, I've actually taken the time to look up each individual example. Ugh, it was the worst. But I suffer for your sake, dear viewer. Needless to say, it hardly came as a surprise that most of the examples on the list fell comfortably into the Jim Elliot, I would never have found Christ in that passage category. Like, did you know Melchizedek offering wine and bread to Abraham was a prophecy of Jesus' Last Supper? I mean, how could you not, right? Or how instructions for burning the remains of sin offerings was actually a prophecy that Jesus would suffer and die outside of Jerusalem. Wow, that's amazing. Or not. That's not to say all of the prophecies in the article are questionable. I found roughly 26 examples that are commonly held as messianic within modern Judaism. But that's 26 out of 353, less than 8%. And of course, Jews and Christians would still disagree on how those 26 examples should be interpreted. Now, here's the rub. I could totally recognize most of these passages as messianic, if, if viewed through a Raz Pesher lens. But that's not how most Christian proof texters like Tim and Josh McDowell interpret those verses. They see the Gospel writers as describing events that were literally predictive, an approach I consider to be, in most cases, anachronistic. So is Bible prophecy really a problem for atheists? Well, to answer that question, you must ask yourself this. Do you find the prophecies of Jesus convincing when they rely so heavily on mysteries for their fulfillment? Do you find them convincing when most of the prophecies are not based on historical grammatical context, but instead hang on isolated passages and, in a few cases, individual words? If I was a first century Jew with a proclivity for apocalyptic paradigms, perhaps I would be convinced. And it seems modern day believers, like Dr. Longenecker, consider Pesher prophecy quite compatible with their faith in Jesus. But if your answer is no, then I'd say Bible prophecy is as threatening as the banana or the crocoduck. In other words, Tim's claim is mostly false bravado based on a serious misunderstanding of the subject matter. The fact is, Tim is the one stuck on the horns of a dilemma. If he believes there are hundreds of extremely specific prophecies about Jesus, then he's simply misinformed about the nature of his Lord's prophetic paradigm. But if he admits Jesus was hidden in the Old Testament, as Luke 24 says, then he can't claim Bible prophecy is a huge problem for atheists, when the prophecies themselves are clearly not obvious. I think even Jim Elliot got that point. As well as a few others. So, bongo, 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 I don't want to leave the Congo, no, 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 no. Bingo, bango, bongo, I'm so happy in the jungle, I refuse to go. Don't want no jailhouse, shotgun, fish hooks, golf club, I got my spears. So, no matter how they coax you, I'll stay right here. Behold, the atheist's nightmare. <laughs> Notice how gracefully it sits over the human hand. Notice it has a point at the top for ease of entry. It's just the right shape for the human mouth. It's chewy, easy to digest. And it's even curved toward the face to make the whole process so much easier. 